Well, thank you for a, a warm Australian welcome. I'm very grateful for, to uh, Tim and the Australian Taxpayers Alliance and also to the IPA for this invitation to come and uh, promote our common ideas. I've had a wonderful time so far. Uh, got to debate an authentic dinosaur, the Marxist professor at the University of Sydney on the morality of capitalism. It was a, it was a real treat and an enjoyable thing. It was like visiting the old world. <laughs> Again, I remember the old days in the Soviet Union, except there weren't any Marxists in the Soviet Union. They were all teaching in Australia and Oxford <laughs> and Harvard and so on. Uh, but I've had a great time also with the ABC, and I really enjoy mixing it up with the other side. And because I think we need to engage them and show that they've made mistakes. And if they thought about it a little bit harder, they'd be here with the IPA. Another thing that's been important to me when I first moved to Austria, I actually thought it was Australia, and it was such a confusion. I was looking for the kangaroos, didn't see any. Uh, but I've always had a very uh, fond feeling towards Australia. This is my first real visit to the country. I was in Sydney a couple of years ago on business, and I was very, 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 very ill. So I got to go to the meetings and the hospital and then leave the country. It wasn't adequate. Every place I've been around the world, if you're at a pub and you're by yourself and some friendly group come up, say, come join us, they're always Australian. And I recognize Australians are among the most warm, decent, honest, authentic people in the world. But I wondered, since all the people I met who were Australians were nice, maybe they just don't give passports to the nasty ones. <laughs> now I've come here, I've seen that theory is wrong. Maybe they just don't let them come to the coastal cities that I've visited. So I'll have to go inland someday and check, check that as well. But the thing that I've been addressing recently is a very serious crisis that's gripping much of the world, and that is the crisis of debt, unfunded liabilities, and the welfare state. If you look at countries such as Greece, much of Europe, and the United States of America, the trend is very, very, very negative. I want to talk about how to understand the welfare state and the potential threats ahead for Australian society as well. So let's start by looking at the welfare state. It has many different names around the world in different languages. But what's remarkable is the degree to which it has colonized the surface of the planet. It's just about everywhere. And even poor countries are told by United States AID, by the European Union, by the Australian aid agencies, you should aspire someday to being a welfare state that the key to your prosperity is not that old-fashioned and boring wealth production, it's redistribution. That that's what you should aspire to, is a redistribu redistributive state. If you think about why the welfare state has come to be so dominant, though, we have to look at it from the lens of political science, which is my special interest here. It's usually described by its advocates as merely an expression of human warmth, solidarity, and goodness. And of course, those who criticize it, wicked, cramped, small-minded, and mean. It's just about being nice. That's not a very good explanation. I'm interested in seeing how it creates constituencies for its perpetuation. It is a political system, and it has been from the first moment it was designed. What we're witnessing right now especially in Europe, but other countries as well, is what is called in economics the tragedy of the commons. That's a situation in which, as you know, with fisheries, everyone wants to catch the fish. If I don't catch the fish, somebody else will. And if there's no property rights to limit or exclude people, everyone has an incentive to overfish. If you go to the Philippines, you can see it in a very stark way, the destruction of much of the fisheries of the Philippines because of overfishing. The fishermen go out and they fish with dynamite. They toss a dynamite stick into the water, it explodes. The fish are stunned by this. And they float to the surface and you can easily catch them. You could try this any time at the local municipal swimming pool. You would see exactly the same thing happen. <laughs> or they pour in bleach. And the bleach asphyxiates the fish, who again float to the surface. But here's the big problem. It kills the coral reef. Coral is a living organism. 
When the coral reef dies, no more fish. So you ask the fishermen, why do you do this? Do you not know that this is killing the coral reef? They know. They're not stupid. It's been explained to them quite well. Why do you keep doing this? And the answer is always the same. If I don't catch the fish, someone else will. There'll be no fish for me at all. Someone else is going to come and catch them. But now we face much the same problem with the welfare state. If I don't go and qualify for that government subsidy, my taxes aren't going down. Somebody else is going to get it. So each one of us has an incentive to go and get what we can from the government in subsidies and special favors and income. Because if I don't collect it, it's not that it's just going to be uncollected. Someone else is going to get it. And I'm still going to end up paying for theirs. So we have a tragedy of the commons now with the welfare state, but it's worse than with fish. The resource we are overusing to exhaustion is each other. Everyone is busy robbing everyone else. And each time we get our little piece, we think, oh, that's great, I got my subsidy. But add up all the subsidies you paid to everyone else. It's much greater for most people than what they're receiving in return. And we have pushed this in many countries, especially in Europe, to exhaustion. Now, thinking about it as a political system, though, let's go back to one of the great fashion models of all time who designed the welfare state. And that is a man known as Otto von Bismarck in one of his more <clears throat> alluring costumes here, as he liked to appear in public with his pickle halba. He was known as the Iron Chancellor. He unified Germany, as he said, not as the liberals wanted, with petitions and referendums and ballots, but with Eisen und Blut, iron and blood, through war. And he fashioned the modern militaristic Germany. He wanted to engage in what we today call nation building or state building, to make people loyal to the German Empire as such, not to their local principalities or local communities as they were before, loyal to the German state. Militarism, all those things came with it, control of the state educational system, propaganda, but also the welfare state, creating systems in which you would be dependent on the state. And he was very explicit about this. We want the German people dependent on the state, to look to the state for their salvation. Instead of having what we today would call an individually capitalized retirement account or a superannuation system in which you set aside your own money and save it for your own retirement, no, the money was going to come into the state and the state would dispense. As he said, just as a soldier is loyal to the emperor because he receives a pension for his service to the state, every worker will be loyal to the state because they will receive a pension from the state. The German liberals, liberal in the more Australian sense, not the American sense, but the German liberals criticized and they said, you will make the German people into slaves, slaves of the state. You will make of us helots. But that was the point. That was exactly the point of it, to create dependency on the state. And it was a remarkably successful program. Now we can contrast two different kinds of extreme statism, we might say. First was the socialist image, the socialist dream, that we would realize human freedom, as Marx put it, as a species being, as a collectivity, by being in charge of our own future. That's the Marxist image of freedom. That when we plan our own destiny collectively, we will be truly free. And for this, any price could be paid. It didn't matter how many millions had to be exterminated because the true freedom was the freedom of the collectivity. And the mere individual was nothing, could be destroyed because the individual wasn't real. What was real was the collective. The individual is a mere manifestation of the collective. And true freedom is to consciously plan the economy, society, science, and so on into the future. It didn't turn out that well. It was a total failure. That vision, outside of a few academic departments, is dead. We have another one that's more modest, the welfare state. It doesn't say we're going to plan all of society. We're not going to abolish the market economy totally. We're going to allow people to own property and have businesses. 
but the state will now be responsible for your well-being and welfare. It will lift from your shoulders your personal responsibility for making decisions about health care or education or retirement. The state will liberate you from that. The state is now going to be responsible for your well-being and will create organs of state administration to provide these. And these vary widely across the world. In some cases, the state was responsible for housing. Think of council housing in the UK and other countries. Austria had a great deal of state housing produced by the Gemeinde, the uh, local state administration. It might be medical care that's fairly common. Some cases totally monopolized. In some cases, the state has only a half provision, like in the United States, about half of all expenditures on medical care are through the state. Or other activities that will be response, the state will take responsibility for those. So it's a more modest vision than the socialist one. But let's think about how it's structured and how it has worked. How were these welfare schemes structured? The first principle that's common all around the world was designed by Bismarck, a very clever man. It's called the pay-as-you-go principle. That is to say, money is paid into a state plan, whether it's for medical care or uh, retirement, and that money is paid out to current recipients. The idea being that those who are currently paying in will receive the money paid in by the next cohort of people who will move into the labor force and pay. Those tend to be very popular at the initial stages. Think about the American social security system, for example. When it was first structured as a pay-as-you-go system, it was pretty popular. There were many people, actually not many, but there were some people who received retirement payments without ever having paid anything in at all. They liked that. That seemed like a very attractive arrangement to them. It wasn't such a huge percentage of the population. There was a sense we could afford this. Huge bulk of the population paying in, small numbers receiving. And then that money was, we were told, put into a trust fund in a little town in West Virginia. It's a piece of paper that says, I owe you $16 trillion. So that's the Social Security Trust Fund, the investment. That money was paid. And indeed, the system went cash negative in the year 2010. In other words, more money being paid out than was being paid in. And it is getting worse every single day. It's broke. So in the early phases, these systems are very popular, but they reach the mature phase after the politician has long since retired or died, and it's left now for later generations to deal with. The other one is fiscal illusion, and this is a common feature of understanding how states are financed. Every politician wants to show you the benefit of what they offer, beautiful, gorgeous thing, and the cost is somehow hidden. And there are lots of mechanisms to hide the cost. Think about tax systems that are so complicated, you can't really tell how much you're paying for it. Well, in this case, a lovely one, also introduced by Bismarck, and a common feature around much of the world, is the so-called employee share and the employer share. When I pay my Social Security tax, I receive my wage statement, employee share of Social Security tax. It doesn't mention the employer share which matches it. But in fact, as any labor economist will tell you, 100% of that came out of my pocket. There is no employer share. It's money the employer was willing to pay to hire me, and instead of coming into my pocket, it went into the government's pocket. If I pay someone $500 to paint my house, I'm not really interested in whether it went into the church collection plate or into the pokies. This is not interesting to me. I'm willing to pay $500 to hire a house painter. The employer is willing to pay that much money. And if the government designates some of it, so-called employer contribution to retirement, it's not causing the employer to pay more. That's the key. So this system, and there are a whole range of schemes to hide the real cost from the, the taxpayer. And then finally, these are characterized ideologically as social rights. It's your right to receive them. It's your social right. It's about solidarity and fairness to receive these benefits from the state. And also, you paid into it for 35 years. Of course it's your right. 
the mere fact that when we broke open the penny piggy bank, there was nothing in it is irrelevant. We've got to go find the money someplace. So that is the structuring of very common features of the welfare state. Now, the Second Reich that Bismarck created collapsed, of course, with the end of the First World War and was replaced by the Weimar Republic, which was considered the most advanced social welfare state. It inherited all of those programs pioneered by Bismarck and expanded them under socialist government. It was considered the most advanced social welfare state on the planet. But it didn't turn out that well either and was replaced by another system that built on top of that the most malignant welfare state that the world has ever seen. And it was an explicit ideology of focusing attention and loyalty on the state and, of course, the one party and its leaders. As Gutz Ali is a very, very good historian, I highly recommend his book, in German, it came in, uh, out as Hitler's Volkstadt, or Hitler's People's State. He asked the question, as a very good historian, by the way, this book has caused an enormous controversy in Germany. He really set the cat among the pigeons with this book, among the socialists. He asked the question, why was the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazi Party, so popular in Germany all the way to the end of the war? If they destroyed Germany. Why were people so loyal until the last days as it totally collapsed and they were defeated? And he says it was the most advanced welfare state in the world. Here's how it worked. <clears throat> he starts out the book by asking a question. When he was a boy growing up in Germany, with his parents, he asked, where did this beautiful furniture come from? And they all get very quiet. It's embarrassing. It was looted from Danish families, from occupied countries. And that was a little clue. What was it that sustained the state? A vast system of taking from other people to give to their supporters. And it turns out, if you do that, you will have a lot of friends. When you steal things from other people and give it to those who support you, those who support you will be really loyal to you. This is how it functioned. The 1930s, they expanded the welfare state even beyond what it had been, and then faced fiscal collapse as he goes through the German books. And he said they began to look out and said, where are we going to get all the money for all of these programs for our Volksgenossen, our ethnic comrades? And of course, who presented themselves? The group they had demonized, the Jews. They designated Jewish property as Volksvermögen, or uh, national or people's treasury, confiscated it, proceeded on, and when they invaded the rest of Europe, they looted every country they occupied. And he documents trainloads of sausage and butter and agricultural products from Poland and Ukraine, all the wines from France, all the luxury goods of Paris, looted and sent back into the Reich. And indeed, they even financed the occupation. A brilliant move. He's a very good financial historian. I highly recommend this book by sending out Nazi bankers to all the central banks of the occupied countries. They paid German soldiers not in, in German marks, or Reichsmarks, as you might have expected. They paid them in special certificates called RKK certificate that could not be taken back to, the, to Germany. It was illegal. They could only be spent locally in Ukraine or Poland or France or Belgium or Greece or Norway. And they were exchangeable at a fixed rate to the local currency. So they just printed them to pay for the occupation. And the consequence was the destruction through inflation of every currency of every occupied country. A very clever and malicious form of looting is inflationism. This created the most malignant welfare state the world had seen. But the ideology was common at the time, not always as malignant. Very fine book by Shari Berman makes the connection, she's a socialist herself, between fascist ideology, social democracy, extreme forms of welfare statism, and so on. They come out of the same well, but were instantiated in more democratic societies, such as Sweden or the United States, in different ways. 
Here we have Franklin Roosevelt promoting, as he said, a second Bill of Rights. The first Bill of Rights of the American Constitution, the first 10 amendments, is modeled on the English Bill of Rights of 1689, and before that, Magna Carta. Statements of limits on the power of the government, not to torture people, arrest them, subject them to cruel and unusual punishment, the right to freedom of speech, which you thankfully, and thanks to the IPA, has been rescued here in Australia, the right to freedom of worship, and so on. But now he said a new Bill of Rights, the right to a house, the right to medical care, the right to an education, the right to high prices if you're in favored industries, by the way, which of course means higher prices for other people. Long lists of these new social rights, all to be financed in a redistributive welfare state. While that is pretty popular at the beginning, but like all such systems, it's a pyramid scheme. For it to function, the base of the pyramid needs to keep getting wider. So these systems, pretty popular, oops, um, during the period of growing and youthful population. But we don't have that anymore. This was foreseeable. The base isn't expanding at the same rate. And these pay-as-you-go systems in their mature phase collapse. They generate what we call fiscal imbalances. That is to say, the difference between what the state expects to receive under current law and tax revenues and what it is obligated to pay out in benefits under current law. There's a big gap. And we can calculate the value of that gap over time, put it all together, it has a present value. Capital markets and interest rates help us to calculate what that is. So Jagadish Gokhale, one of the world's experts on these de demographic and fiscal imbalances, has very conservatively calculated, I don't mean politically conservative, I mean statistically and in terms of conservative assumptions, the fiscal imbalance. For the United States, at least $80 trillion. And for the European Union, at least $53 trillion. That's calculated over a shorter time horizon because the Statistical data are different between the EU and the US. Just to be clear what that means, it doesn't mean they're going to have to collect $80 trillion in taxes. It's actually much more than that. What it means is that's the amount the US government would have to have today invested in income producing assets, earning interest at least at the rate they pay on government debt, just to finance the shortfall, not to pay for the whole thing just the shortfall in addition to all anticipated tax collections. He calculated it for European Union member states. This is a couple of years old from 2009. It's since gotten worse. If you take Greece, 10.9%, what that means is that's the amount of GDP you would have to extract from the Greek economy and dedicate only to funding the welfare state in addition to all current taxes. Translate that into taxes on wage income, it's about a 35% points increase in the taxes. So if you're paying 40% now, you'd have to be paying 75% just to finance the difference. That's not going to happen. What it means is we're not going to be able to pay these bills in many, many countries. Now, it's not just unfunded liabilities. We hear a lot because of the class warfare generated by many people about the intragenerational conflict, the 1% and the 99% and on and on and on. We're going to suck the money out of the rich. As Michael Moore, the American uh, movie director you may have seen, great man, uh, <laughs> as he put it in an interview not too long ago, he said, there's plenty of money. It's in the houses of the rich. Think of that. We're just going to go in. The rich have all that money. It's under their beds. They have chests of gold coins. This is the mentality. Just loot them, and we can pay for everything. Of course, the rich generally don't have chests of gold coins under their beds. This is not the 11th century anymore. Their wealth is in the productive assets in which they have invested. It's in firms and companies and farms and mines and we only broke into their houses. That's where all the wealth is. But there's a bigger transfer, not just that one, but the intergenerational transfer. 
from young people to older people. When I say older people, I mean me, people my age group who are going to be receiving substantial sums of money from taxpayers who are currently six or four. And it turns out, interesting feature of democratic theory, people who are 56 vote in higher numbers than people who are four. <laughs> and consequently, they cannot defend their interests. They're being looted. And I think it's grossly unfair that this is happening because they cannot defend themselves as we loot their futures. The consequence is a lot more countries face a Greek future than understand it. And here I'll blame a little bit some of the conservatives in Europe and the United States who lost their way. They lost their way. The Bush administration in the United States, so-called compassionate conservatism, let's be a little more socialistic, let's compete with the Democrats by handing out more money. And they spent money like a drunken, I could say, like a drunken sailor Friday night after getting paid in port. But I won't say that. It is an insult to drunken sailors everywhere. <laughs> they broke the bank. And then the Democrats came in, and I thought, well, no one could spend faster than that. I was wrong. They now have accelerated this process even further. And in Greece, the European Greek conservatives raised government spending from 42% to 51% of GDP in five short years. Imagine that and hired 100,000 new government employees, all their cousins, onto the government payroll in a country of 11 million people, and helped to break the bank. So the conservatives who lost their way, along with the socialists, have looted those countries. And what is the consequence? Rioting, the only country I've seen with massive anti-government protests made up entirely of government employees. Really quite, quite amazing in Athens. Uh, violence and the destruction of the political center, the rise of violent, dangerous extremist parties, the coalition of the radical left, which are Stalinists, and the Golden Dawn Party. Does this look familiar to anyone? It is, of course, a traditional Greek emblem you would see in any Corinthian column. But we know what it is intended to mean. It is not an accident that we're there displaying a swastika. It is a Nazi party. And in Hungary, the Jobbik Party, similarly, rising in significance, 44 members of parliament, openly Nazi party. Their leader in parliament, Martin Jonjushi, in December when I was in Budapest, called openly, he said, I call on the government to release a list of all the Jews in the country. This is in Hungary, if you know the history. 500,000 Jews exterminated 1944, 1945. And to hear that simply chills the blood. Why? All their welfare benefits can't be paid for anymore. Someone is to blame. And whom do we blame? Ourselves? No, of course not. That's, that's so harsh. How easy it is to blame outsiders, hated minorities, Jews, bankers, business people, entrepreneurs, foreigners, outsiders. That's the easy group to blame. Now, these unfunded liabilities are not going to be paid. There's an old saying, anything that, if something cannot keep going on, it won't. And this cannot keep going on, so it won't. Now is the time to ask, what is the alternative? And this is a time, I believe very strongly, for Australians to ask those questions now, not in 20 years, when it may be too late. You do not want to be asking them as the Greeks are asking now. Now is the time for Australians to say, what can we do to make sure we do not head off that cliff? And to start to ask about alternatives to the welfare state. So let me look at just a couple from the history of what existed before welfare state institutions. So these are a few options. Let me start with self-help and a very important concept, and that is economic growth. What makes it possible to produce more wealth? Angus Madison, the great Danish economic statistician, calculated per capita income around the world from the year one until roughly the present period. He died a couple of years ago. 
And you'll notice it's pretty flat. A little bump up in the high Middle Ages, the growth of cities in Europe, or the Southern Sung Dynasty, revival of trade. It falls during the general crisis of the 17th century. If you look very carefully at the numbers, that's the 30 years war in Europe, for example. And then something amazing happens. It becomes almost vertical, starting in Great Britain, and the North American colonies, and then later in countries such as Australia, Western Europe, Japan, and so on. Our world is unrecognizable to the generations that preceded us. They wouldn't know how to understand our modern world, the prosperity we enjoy. What made that possible? A very fine book by Deirdre McCloskey. She's an economic historian, bourgeois dignity. I highly recommend this book. It was the emergence of free market capitalism. It was respect for wealth creators not to be sent through the tradesmen's entrance, entrance, as they used to say, but people who are able to produce wealth in the market economy and were honored as a consequence. Previous civilizations, only warriors and priests had honor, but wealth producers had none. And as Joseph Schumpeter said, in the 19th century, you saw in the first time in the history of the human race, what he called, it's a lovely phrase, a business respecting civilization in which business was a source of honor and pride. But it's not all about just business. There are other ways that people provided for welfare. We had such institutions as savings clubs. Skyfeisen Bank was originally a working class savings club and friendly societies. And Australia, in particular, had a very rich history of friendly societies. This country was pioneered by people organized for mutual benefit and mutual aid in friendly societies. Unfortunately, they're largely forgotten, but there are a few remnants in popular culture to remind us. And here's the one that I like to put up for American students. You know, the Flintstones. Many people learn their history from cartoons. They believe dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time. They're in the Flintstones, must be true. And I asked the students, I said, what is this? Who, what are Barney and Fred and Betty and Wilma doing here? They're not sure. I said, well, they're someplace. I said, well, they're at the lodge. Yes, that's right. They went to the lodge. And I asked them, now, how many of your parents went to the lodge or go to the lodge? Usually not one hand will go up. I said, well, my parents went to the lodge. My mom and my dad went to the lodge. A few people here also. What did they do at the lodge? They met their friends, they had a nice time, they socialized, and they helped each other. That was very important. They helped the other members of the lodge. If you were sick, someone looked in on you. There was a benevolent fund to take care of you. There was wid widows and orphans funds, and they helped the community. They built hospitals. They assisted the indigent. They built schools. Those were the backbone of civil society. They were enormously important for the development of free societies of independent persons made possible democratic political orders. They were all over the developed world. They used rituals, uniforms, and symbols to help to develop that fellow feeling, outrageous and outlandish hats, for example. Uh, but they were systematically targeted for destruction by the welfare state. And this was not just an accident or an unintended consequence as some institutions were, the American family was very much harmed as an unintended consequence of the policy of paying women less money if they were married and more money if they weren't. Turns out, unintended consequence of that was husbands became a liability. And so marriage rates go down in certain communities and out of wedlock birth rises. No one actually intended that. I talked to some of the people who designed those programs. They said. We didn't really mean that. But this was intentional. They saw the friendly societies as sources of working class support for liberalism, for free trade, for free markets, for limited government. And the Fabian socialists said they have to go. They passed institute, uh, laws that made it very difficult to establish these groups. David Green, who's also co-author of a very important study of the Australian friendly societies, documented them in the UK. If you want, you can 
find his book is online from Institute of, for uh, Economic Analysis, which is uh, similar to IPA, just not as old and long established, uh, and the organization that helped Mrs. Thatcher to do what she did. You can find it online, Reinventing Civil Society and David Green, and Senor Google will take you directly to the book to download. And he looks at how they grew so rapidly until 1911, and the National Health Act was passed. That required you to pay state taxes to receive medical benefits for which you'd already been paying your dues to the Friendly Society. And what was the consequence over time? I'm paying the tax to be able to visit the hospital and see the doctor, and I pay my dues to do the same. The tax is compulsory. I can't say, no, I'm not going to pay that this year. So they stop paying their dues, and Friendly Society membership begins to decline. <clears throat> the consequence was devastating in many countries. You got dependence instead of independence. Incoherent systems, we're now seeing what is happening. When you mix insurance and redistribution in the same pot, this is a really bad mix. If you're gonna have insurance, it should be insurance. If you want redistribution, put it over here and call it redistribution. When you put them in the same pot, you're gonna have a catastrophe 20, 30, 40 years down the road. The displacement of civil society organizations and social fragmentation. Some communities much worse than others. The African-American community that was targeted by the welfare state was virtually shattered as a consequence. Family structure was so deeply harmed with terrible consequences for millions of people. Now you might think, well, we can't have friendly societies anymore. Who would wear the silly hats? And indeed, they wouldn't be the same as they were in the 1950s when the Flintstones cartoons were made and people still were members of friendly societies. But we do have them with us. Here's one that I like a lot, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a friendly society. And something I learned from my personal family history uh, is non-alcoholics cannot really help alcoholics. It needs the other alcoholics who know the problems that they face. We had this problem with one of my brothers. My other brother and I intervened several times. We were not successful. Finally, it was AA that helped him to lead a life of sobriety in a way that his brothers could not, because we didn't really understand the problems in the way that these other people did. They have meetings every night people can go to and receive mutual support and strength when they struggle with these terrible temptations. There's a telephone number you can call. Someone will talk to you. You say, I really want to take a drink. Think about your family. Tell me about your husband or wife or kids. It's a very important, friendly society. It's very successful every place in the world except authoritarian states where it's illegal. In China and in President Putin's Russia, they forbid it. <clears throat> it's viewed as a competitor to the state. So I think that there's a better way. And that better way is to abandon pay-as-you-go systems think seriously about the long-term future of any redistributive systems that the state may have as social safety nets. Don't assume that they're just going to be puttering along. We don't have a problem in 40 years. Encourage people, like with the superannuation system, to save for their own retirement. That's a very sound approach. And at the end of your working years, it's yours. You can do what you want with it. Buy an annuity. And if you die beforehand, it goes to your heirs, unlike typical state pension plans that just disappear if you die before qualifying for it. We want to make hard choices and cut back on unaffordable expenditures. This has to be done. You will be painted as heartless and cruel and nasty people. But know that you are taking charge and care of the society of the future of those six-year-old children who cannot defend their interests at the ballot box. That's your job, to stand up for them and say, what will society be like in 30 or 40 years? And take a longer-term perspective. Encourage responsibility. Encourage people to think about the future, plan for their own old age, and allow civil society to fill the space. Remove obstacles, and there are quite a few, to people voluntarily solving their problems and find ways to create the legal framework for voluntary association rather than state compulsion. So the book that I produced on this has come out in an Australian edition. It's 
So I'm sure you could get a copy, or if you're too cheap, like me, you can go online and download the whole PDF uh, and enjoy it there. A few quick thoughts then about Mrs. Thatcher. And I was also shocked, as Tim was, uh, to see pictures of people celebrating with party hats uh, and um, noisemakers, the death of, of a great lady. Uh, I hope that neither I nor anyone connected to me would be so small-spirited and mean as to celebrate the death of someone with whom I disagree. And even people I strongly, robustly disagree with, uh, I would be ashamed if I ever toasted the death of a human being. It's just not something that one should toast. And indeed, even people I really, really dislike one might say, well, it's a good thing that Muammar Gaddafi is not there anymore, or, or Hitler, or someone like that. But even then, I, I wouldn't have a party. I would say, human life has been extinguished. That might be necessary. But certainly, what we saw was really, really disgusting. And I hope some of those younger people who have been encouraged by their elders will someday grow up and feel ashamed and just deeply ashamed at that. Mrs. Thatcher was successful. She saved Britain uh, from sliding down the drain. You remember the winter of discontent, 1979, and the civil unrest and collapse of that society it was the sick man of Europe. They were rapidly swirling around the drain. And Mrs. Thatcher had the courage to stand up for Britain for the Britain that created wealth, for the Britain that was a free society. And she did it with the support of people like the IPA here in Australia, the Institute of Economic Affairs. As she said, without the IEA, none of this would have been possible. She said, there were not many of you in the beginning. You were the few, but you were right. And she said at IEA's dinner, she said, you save Britain. That is what it takes. It takes being willing to stand up for what's right, being painted by your enemies with every horrible slander and malicious lie, but in a calm and dignified way to stand up for what is right. And I really, really salute IPA for doing that in Australia, that Australians, those four-year-old six-year-old Australians will be able to be citizens of a free, prosperous, flourishing country. And when that happens, some of them will be wise enough or informed enough by their grandparents and great-grandparents to look back and thank the IPA and thank all of you for saving their country. Thank you for your attention.